Our lesson this week titled Josiah Calls the People Back to God. It is our last lesson for the summer quarter. And again, we are left with asking and answering a question. Can the youth, can they become leaders? Can they lead in the church? What is it that you think about that? All summer long, we have taken a look at the fact that God, he can and he will use anybody, man, woman, boy or girl, adult or even children. As we have seen young girls, young men, we have seen in the past couple of weeks, God, he will use for his purpose. And so here again in our Sunday school lesson this week, it is shown to us that God, he can use the youth. Once again, as I said in last week's lesson, we should not ignore the youth. We should not ignore their, their opinions. We should not ignore their voices because once again, God can and he will use anyone. So our lesson today, it takes place there in the 22nd chapter of 2 Kings. It starts off there in the 22nd chapter. We'll see there in the eighth verse that the high priest of that day in Judah, he found the book of the law in the house of the Lord, the house of the Lord, of course, being the temple. This was the temple that Solomon built. Now, the fact that he found the book of the law in the temple, the fact that he did not know where it was, this already tells us something about the day in which he was living in or the day prior to this moment that we see here in scripture. Why did he find the book of the law? He should have knew exactly where it was in the house of God. It would be like me going to the church and having to find a Bible in the church. I shouldn't have to find a Bible in the church. They should, they should be available in the church, right? So here we'll see where Judah, like their brothers in the Northern kingdom, those 10 tribes, or at that point in time, nine tribes that were, were in Israel, Judah had become like them. The, the Northern kingdom was filled with nothing but evil kings who had turned the people away from the Lord. And because the people were turned away from God, because they did evil in the sight of God, we saw where the Assyrians, where they came in and they, they defeat Ahab and they conquered the Northern kingdom of Israel. Again, God permitted that to happen because Israel was living simply. Now the Southern kingdom we'll see here if we take a look back at the 21st chapter of 2 Kings and we take a look at the first two verses there, we'll see that prior to the reign of Josiah, there was a king there named Manasseh, who again was a young king, I will note there in that verse. And we'll see there in that verse that he reigned for 55 years. He was a king, he did evil in the sight of the Lord. He set up bells in, in, in Jerusalem, he set up uh, wooden images, Asherahs in, in Jerusalem. He even went to the temple and he desecrated the temple, putting the, inside of the temple, a carved image of an Asherah in the temple. So we had this wicked and this evil king who reigned for 55 years in Jerusalem, desecrating the temple. We're told there in the 21st chapter, when he died, we're told there that his son, his son named Amon, we're told that he reigned. His reign, it was a short reign. He reigned for, for only two years because the people, his, his people, they came up and, and they killed him. So 57 years of Manasseh and then Ammon with them combined, there was nothing but wicked rule. Ammon, like his dad, he was an evil king. And so we'll see, we can understand why this high priest going into the temple and finding the book of the law, we can see why it now makes sense because the temple had been so desecrated by these wicked and these evil kings, they had even put the law away from them. They literally put the law away from them. So we'll see there again, as we take a look at the eighth verse there, that the priest and the scribe, that they read this book of the law. This would have been the first time that, that that book had been read for for quite some time, right? And so after reading the law, we'll see there in the 10th verse, that the scribe then took the book of the law. He took it to the king. He took it to Josiah. Imagine what Josiah must have felt like hearing these words. Again, Josiah, as we'll see there in the 22nd chapter, there in the opening of the 22nd chapter, Josiah, he was a young king. 
he, he was made king when he was eight years old. Now, of course, he didn't make any decrees at the age of eight years old. I imagine that he had to, of course, be raised. He had to be taught. But we're told that by the time he was 26 years old, in the 18th year of his reign, we will see where he set forth a, a righteous project, a righteous work, if you will, to where he set forth for the people to restore the temple. This is why we see where the high priest was inside of the temple, why he was in the house of the Lord. This is, this is what led to him uh, actually finding the book of the law. And so with the book of the law now being read to Josiah, one whose heart was not like Manasseh, was not like Amon's heart as well, Josiah had a, a heart that was of faith. He had a heart that was righteous. He's hearing these words from a book that had not been read for quite some time. And you have to imagine that, that his heart, that it burned with fire for, for this law that, was, that he was hearing. Because this was a man, unlike the other two kings, this was a man that loved the Lord. We'll see just how much he loved the Lord as we now skip over to the 23rd chapter of 2 Kings there. And we take a look at the first verse. Now we'll see there in that verse that Josiah, he sent these two men, he sent them to gather all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. What is it that Josiah was up to? We'll see there in the second verse that all of them, they went up to the house of the Lord. They went up to the temple. They went up to the temple. You'll notice there, they went up there with all the men of Judah. They went up there with the priests, the scripture tells us, the prophets and all the people. Josiah has essentially gathered the, the congregation, all the congregation of Judah. And he had the words of the book of the covenant. He had them read in the hearing of all the people. We talked about the book of the law. We see the book of the covenant here again, essentially the same thing. When we talk about the book of the law in this scripture, it could mean a couple of things. We could be talking about the, the complete law, the Pentateuch, which is the first five books of, of the Bible that we have here, the Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, uh, uh, and Deuteronomy. It could be that, or some suggest that, that they were reading from Deuteronomy. That is what some will suggest as well. It could be one or, or the two here. But he has, again, he has this book read in the hearing of all of the congregation of Judah. And again, this was something that, that all the people there, they would not have heard in the last 57 years for them. Imagine going 57 years and not hearing one word read from the Bible itself. You know, I can go around and I can, I can quote you scripture. I can't necessarily quote you the whole Bible word for word. So if we were to go 57 years and then somebody finally opened up, they find the Bible and open up, just imagine the feelings that would have been washing over these people who had lived through the 57 years of the wickedness of the reigns of Manasseh and Ammon. They lived through all of the, the idolatry that was going on, the desecration of the temple. Imagine how, how hearing these words, how it would have felt washing over them. And so we'll see there that after this had happened in the third verse, we're told that, that Josiah standing by a pillar, he made a covenant. He made a covenant, a promise that is before the Lord. And in this, this covenant that he made there, the scripture tells us he, he promised to follow the Lord. He promised to keep his commandments to keep his testimonies and to keep his statutes, not half heartedly, but with all his heart and with all his soul. This is, is what faith looks like. I want to be very clear here. This isn't a, a profession of faith. And this is not Josiah putting on a show. Some of us, we, we go to the church, and when the doors of the church and uh, the church are open, we'll get up and, and we'll go and we'll sit in the chair. I know I did this when I was little. And they'll ask, do you want to join the church? Do you believe in Christ? And I remember being a little boy saying, yeah, yeah. You know, I didn't really have an idea for, for, for what I was doing there. But now if I could do it all over again at the age that I am now, I would be proud to do that. 
because again, it's not simply a profession, which a lot of people make it out to be, but it is about the confession of the heart. There is a difference, which you have heard me speak about before. There are many people who profess to, to believe in Christ, but they don't actually walk by faith. Here we see where Josiah, he is making a promise. He is making a vow. And as it is said to us in, in the book of Ecclesiastes, when you make a vow, when you make a promise to the Lord, you best keep that vow. You best keep that promise. The Lord, he does not love fools. The Lord desires when we make a vow, he desires for us to be faithful to it. He desires for us to keep it. Why is that? Because he himself, has made a promise to us. He has made a, a covenant, if you will, with us through his only begotten son, that we who believe in him will not perish and ha but have everlasting life. God, he is faithful to his promises. So if we are going to make a vow, if we are going to make a promise, the Lord looks for us to be faithful just as he is faithful. So again, warning, you better be faithful when you make a vow to the Lord. Josiah here doing this outwardly, a confession, a vow here with the Lord about his faith here, he has to be faithful to it. And again, what I want to point out here is his age. This young man in his 18th year, that doesn't mean that he was 18 years old. Like I said, he was 26 years old. He's standing before the people and, and he's making this confession of faith. Do you think that that would inspire those who, who were seeing this confession? Do you think it would have inspired them to, to move in faith as well after they had, they had gone through 57 years of wickedness? And I asked this question in my most recent sermon. If you haven't watched that sermon, be sure to go and watch that sermon. I asked, what kind of impact are you having on the lives of, of those that are around you? Is your faith, is it having an impact? on those that are around you for the good. Are you bearing good fruit? We as God's children, we should not be bearing fruit that is bitter. We should not be bearing fruit that is sour. We should be bearing fruit that is sweet, that is good for one to consume. Good spiritual fruit is what we should be bearing. And again, we should, in other words, be having a good impact on the lives of those that are around us, like Josiah, we should be inspiring those that are around us. Scripture, it tells us there that after this young man had, again, made this vow with the Lord openly like that, we're told there in the third verse, there in the 23rd chapter of 2 Kings, that all the people, they took a stand that day for the covenant. See, this is the impact of, of what the, the righteous, this is the impact of what the righteous can do. Again, the wicked, those 57 years, they had caused people to sin. They had caused people to sin. But again, I want you to understand today that the righteous, we can turn people to do the opposite. Where the wicked can lead one to sin, the righteous can lead one to righteousness. And that again should be our goal as, as God's children. We have the ability to have a bigger impact on the lives of all of those that are around us. Now we'll see there, in the 21st verse, when we skip down there to the 21st verse in the 23rd chapter, we'll see there that Josiah, he then, again, moving in faith here, all right, he commanded all the people to keep the feast of the Passover. This this feast, Passover feast, again, we know how important the, the Passover feast, how important it is for the children of Israel, but this feast, it was lost during those years of wickedness. Again, the book of the law was lost in the temple. And so even this feast, this important feast, it, it was lost because again, uh, the wickedness of the kings, this was something that, that again, this was something that happened in the Northern kingdom of Israel. Okay, when, when all those evil kings, when they set up their bells and their idols, they turned the people away from God's law. They turned the people away from, from, from keeping God's feast as well. And again, these feasts, we know that they, that they were sacred. And so we're told there in the 22nd verse that this Passover was a Passover that had been like none that had ever been held since the days of the judges, which is actually incredible 
because the days of the judges, as we have seen in scripture, they were some, some rocky days. They, they, there were some highs and there were certainly some lows as well, but their highs were a great deal better than again, what had been seen in Judah during that time period. I remember something that my dad said after he had turned 50 years old about having young people around uh, him. He, he loved young people to, to, to be around in the church because he always felt that the youth in the church could inspire the, the elders in the church to get up and to go. And, and scripture speaks about that as well to where yes, the, the elders have the wisdom, the young, they have the ability to get up and they have the ability to run, they have the ability to move. And, and I've shared this with you all in the past couple of, uh, of lessons. God, he will use the youth for that very reason, okay? The word of God should not be stagnant. It should not sit still. And you hear me say this about faith all the time. Faith, it wants to get up. Faith, it wants to go. It wants to, to move. The youth is able to get up and go. The youth is able to get up and move. And, and I feel like the fact that, that many of the youth today feel like they have been pushed away from the church, it has, it has truly hurt the local congregation. Uh, now, and I would say the average local congregation. You go to a local church nowadays, there's a very good chance you're not going to see much youth in the church. And again, it's not because they don't believe. It's not because they, they don't have faith. There, there are many young people who are searching for the Lord today. They want to know God. They want to know the truth. That has never been something that is missed from mankind. Mankind is always hungered and thirst for, for the truth. But I remember growing up and, and I'm one of the rare ones to where I wasn't pushed away from, from the word of God. It, it's hard to push me away from, from anything that I, that I love, but there were many who were my age who felt like they weren't allowed to essentially uh, be themselves in the church. They weren't allowed to use their gifts in the church. They felt forced to do things in the church. They weren't allowed to grow and they felt pushed away from the church. And, and that honestly was a failure. It's truly a failure today if we continue to push the youth away from the Lord. That is not something that we should be doing. The youth, we are seeing that they do have a word that we certainly should not ignore. We should not ignore the voices of the youth. We always talk about how the youth is our future. Well, if they are our future, we should certainly listen to them, right? If they are our future, then we should help them, right? And so again, God, he can, he will use the youth. He will raise up young leaders who will be able to lead the church after us. And so instead of holding them down, instead of holding them back, guess what we should be doing? We should be helping them. We should be supporting them. We should be guiding them, further training them, helping them so that when the time comes for them in their 18th year of their reign, like we see here with Josiah today, when that time comes, they will be ready to set forth in their righteous work. So will you do that today? I hope that you would take away from this summer quarter of lessons to, to never hold anybody back from, from doing a good work. Again, whether they're a woman or whether they're a boy or a girl, don't hold anybody back, support them, okay? So if you missed any of the summer quarter Sunday school lessons, again, you can go back to the summer playlist and you can listen to and watch all of these wonderful lessons. They are truly great lessons that I, again, that I hope that you enjoy. And I hope that you'll come back for our Sunday school lesson next week. First lesson of the fall quarter. It's gonna be a good one. We're gonna be taking a look at Daniel, which again, it shows us how the Holy Spirit works because I have been preaching about Daniel for the past few Sundays. So again, I certainly hope that you'll come back for the fall quarter of Sunday school lessons. Hey there, thanks for watching this week's Sunday School lesson. I hope that you enjoyed this lesson. I hope that you'll share this lesson with someone somewhere. And if you have any questions, if you have any comments, don't be afraid to leave a question. Don't be afraid to leave a comment as well. And again, if you aren't doing so already, make sure that you're following the New Found Faith channel. Make sure you hit the alert bell so that you don't miss any of our wonderful videos that we have here on our YouTube page.